I, uh, uh, so I'm hearing those poems after having had too much coffee today. Um, I feel like I am a montage in a Nine Inch Nails video. Um, uh, take care of, I don't know, do what you will with that. Um, so, uh, Reha's up next. Uh, Reha's out. Um, Reha read something that I think like like melted the uh, genre theory class. Um, like we're all we're all still recovering. Um, so here we are. We're gonna we're, we'll, we'll we'll do it again to ourselves now. Uh, Reha Zhang hails from the island city state of Singapore and arrived at Pitt via a series of serendipitous encounters during a UC Berkeley summer program and a residency at Vermont Studio Center, among other things. She writes essays in poetry, and her literary work prior to Pittsburgh includes co-editing a multi-genre anthology on air and air travel. All of her adult life, Reha has believed with poet Louis McNeese that world is crazier and more of it than we think incorrigibly plural. Her hope is that her writing will always reflect that plurality. Ray Hazank. Hey, hi everyone. Um, I won't be melting your heart today. I'm not reading from that piece. <laughs> okay, um, this one is um, from another essay that I wrote. Um, it's called, the essay is called Home and Evolution. I wrote this essay in three continents over two years. Um, so Asia, Europe, and America. Um, and I, I think the, the structure of the essay is, is kind of in fragments. Um, kind of reflects the kind of fragmentary way I kind of went about writing this. Um, it's called Home and Evolution because it is an essay about home and it's an essay about um, how our sense of what home is, where home is, um, changes over time. And um, the first time I kind of tried to submit this to somewhere and I actually titled it Home and, and Evolution Part 1. <laughs> and I promised the editor, okay, there will be a part 2, okay, there, there will be. And the editor, who is a friend of mine and who kind of knows me, he was like, are you sure there's going to be a part two? You better get rid of the part one. Don't, just, just home and evolution will be fine. And, um, well, that, that was a couple of years ago. I still haven't written part two, but um, I'm hoping to. Here. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, two sections. Um, a section from the middle of the essay and the closing section. Here in California, there is all the land in the world. So sprawl happens. Even the streets are wider, and it takes getting used to. Neighborhoods stretching on and on into nowhere. Vast outlet malls splayed out next to highways like flattened cardboard boxes. Empty stretches of road that you can drive down for miles without seeing a single human habitation. Every day, walking back from campus to the grey shingled house, that is my temporary home in Berkeley. I stop at the crest of the steep sloped road and look down the vista of century-old houses towards the sliver of sea gleaming on the horizon. Along the roadside grows a patch of lavender, looking slightly dusty and faded, as roadside flowers do. Some days, if the fog has, has lifted, I can see the Golden Gate Bridge, its arches gentle against the Pacific blue sky. It's freeing, purifying, Something inside unfurls and unwinds, sprawls. It's a lightening, an untightening, all of a piece with the way the Berkeley Hills seem to unfold and undulate, green in the summer light. I know I will miss this spaciousness when I go back to Singapore. I will do all I can to remake for myself a little bit of California in my little native city-state, 17 by 30 miles in size. I will avoid the hordes in town on weekends, seek out the few nature spots still left on our island, and it will still not be enough. It is not the fault of the people. Goodness knows we've tried so hard. 
but the land comes with its limitations. And in a place so tiny, there comes a point when even human ingenuity hits the walls of what nature has withheld. We've built up, built down. Most of the island is covered in high rises. And we've tunneled so much underground that sometimes I fear the city will just cave in, its foundations undermined by too much desire, turned in on itself. Other cities expand horizontally, crawling, sprawling, by they creep across the terrain, boxy structures continually encroaching on the line between lived in and not lived in. In Singapore, once we've exhausted the limits of space, we devour time instead, tearing down old buildings, exhuming cemeteries, cutting down swaths of rainforest that have taken centuries to grow. We erase the past, cut our links with history. More than most other places, ours is a layered city. We've built and destroyed and built again, strata by invisible strata. And if each of these strata could suddenly and magically be made manifest, we would see a multitude of cities, the oldest tucked away in the inmost core of this vertical megalopolis, glowing quiet in the night. These days, I find myself wondering what Singapore would look like if we had all the land in the world. The vertical strata of that hypothetical megalopolis would then extend horizontally across space, like in so many other bigger countries, so that all our history would be laid out as in a map. At the core of it all, tropical jungle, then the fortifications of the Majapahit Empire, wooden fishermen's huts, the Malay Sultan's palaces, followed by colonial buildings with their Roman columns, Pranakan shop houses, elegant skyscrapers, and finally, the postmodern monstrosities we've been building for the last decade, the spiky domed durian, the silvery decked UFO. And interspersed between all of these vast tracts of land, orchards, cemeteries, rainforests, time rendered visible rather than erased in the very geography of our city state. Okay, this is the last segment. Walking home one day, two months before coming to California, I remembered the old trees that used to line the avenue where I live. Mempart trees, I think. Though I cannot be sure, Google gave no conclusive answer. I recall them so clearly. Deep grooved trunks overgrown with moss and ferns, white seeds spinning in the wind, wings like helicopter blades, delicate pink and white flowers carpeting the road in the after rain quiet. I miss those trees, towering above the houses. They gave shade to the whole neighborhood. Looking out from my bedroom window, I used to see dark, dense foliage crisscrossed with sturdy branches. In the mornings, the entire housing estate was a symphony of birdsong. It's all gone now. A few years after I returned from London, the National Parks Board embarked on a massive tree extermination campaign in my neighborhood. Someone had lodged a complaint about the crows that took shelter in the trees, and someone else had written in about the danger that falling tree trunks posed to cars parked in the driveways and along the roads. So, without so much as a written notification, the felling began. All but two of the old trees were cut down. The two that survived were smaller, not so massive, and therefore not so much of a danger. The neighbourhood where I grew up has changed, not beyond recognition, but enough that the things I grew attached to as a child no longer exist. The neatly manicured park just behind my house used to be a basketball court. My father taught me to ride a bicycle there. And as, as a 12-year-old, I used to linger around my lookout at the upstairs study window, picking out the cute guys among the older boys who played football there every evening. I remember coming home one day from work several years ago, only to find the basketball court had been replaced by an angry heap of rubble spread out across the whole area. Jagged slabs of concrete lying haphazardly like beached whales, gasping for breath under the evening stars. No one had told us this was going to happen. Just before I left for California, just before I left for California, I told myself that I should take a photo of the 24-hour Indian coffee shop 
at the corner of the row of shop houses near, near where I live, just in case. I bring all my friends to that place. I've had late night suppers and early dawn breakfast there. Its green and yellow walls have been privy to any number of quiet confidences. It serves some of the best cheap Indian food in Singapore. Crisply laid, layered pratas, fragrant nasi biryani, tenderly pungent mutton, mutton curry. I often stop by on my way back from work for a glass of Deo Ice Limon. The cold, tangy irony of fresh lime and sweetened black tea is such a mood lifter at the end of a long day. But the shop houses are slowly being demolished. Just four, do four doors down, there is a construction site, all boarded up and harboring a bright yellow crane. The powling has started, and the clanging noise vies with traffic for dominance every morning. Who knows if the coffee shop will still be there when I go, when I go back. I didn't take the photo.